All right, moving on, moving on. We're in section 4.2. Woo! So, uh, we're going to be learning graphing polynomials using polynomials to model things. So let's just get right into it. We are going to learn how to graph polynomial functions, not completely, but just some more tricks. Um, how to use a graphing utility to graph a polynomial function, which we've already done a few times as part of earlier examples. And then while we learned in chapter uh, one how to do linear functions to model data, and then in chapter two, I think I may be off, I think it was chapter two we did linear, and then in chapter three we learned how to make quadratic models from data, and a quadratic number is a degree two polynomial. We're going to learn some cubic models, a degree three polynomial. So can you graph the polynomial function 3x plus 1 times x minus 2 squared? So before bringing up the full solution, try this on your own. Ask what are its intercepts? What are the roots? What is the multiplicity? That tells me whether the graph crosses if it's of odd multiplicity or just deflects if it's of even multiplicity. How many turning points does it have in between roots? Where is it positive versus negative? Things like that. Okay, so, oh, I, and I forgot to mention end behavior. So if we expand the polynomial and just distribute everything out, first the x minus two squared. If we expand this out, we get x squared minus four x plus four. Uh, if you need to actually go through and verify x times x is x squared minus two x minus two x plus four, and then get here, that's fine. Distributing out something squared like that should get to be very fast. You're going to save yourself a time and energy if you just practice how to square things over and over again so that you can directly, without having to do intermediate work, get right here. Okay, distributing this out, let me clear out all of our pen marks. Um, distributing this out <clears throat> is just a matter of taking all possible combinations you can. 3x times x squared gives me 3x cubed. 3x times negative 4x gives me negative 12x squared. 3x times 4 gives me 12x. And now let's do 1 times x squared, 1 times negative 4, and 1 times 4. That's just how you distribute things out. Take all possible combinations. Then collect like terms. Okay, We have a negative 12x squared and a positive 1, which gives me negative 11x squared. We have a plus 12x and minus 4x gives us plus 8x. Okay. This is now already written in standard form. It's of degree 3 with a positive leading coefficient. Okay. This means we can really just, for end behavior, look at that first uh, term, 3x cubed, which means, once we get to graphing, by the way, that since it is an odd degree, it goes up on one side and down on the other. And since it has a positive thing out in front, that 3, it is uh, left is negative end behavior and right is positive end behavior. What does it do in between? I'm really not sure, but the end behavior is gonna be down on the left, up on the right. Okay, now let's just find some intercepts. My intercept is always very straightforward. Just plug in zero and you'll get out four. So I just to remind ourselves, here is our function. The factored form is usually gonna be more helpful to us. Okay, so it's three x plus one times x minus two squared. There's our function f of x. So if I just plug in 0, you'll end up with a 4. Okay. Now to solve f of x equals 0, here's where the beauty of the factored form really helps. So I set y equal to 0, but now I have 3x plus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 2 equals 0, which means either the 3x plus 1 was 0 or the x minus 2 squared was 0, either x to 1 third or x equals 2. We immediately find from the factored form all of our intercepts, x equals negative 1 third and x equals 2. Okay, so we found one y-intercept, because it's a function, we can only ever have one y-intercept. And we found two x-intercepts, and we know that's all of them, because we were quite explicitly able to solve this expression right here and find all solutions. Okay, now we uh, want to look at multiplicity. And remember, if the zero has odd multiplicity, the graph crosses at the root. But if it has even multiplicity, it just touches. So the zeros we found, and again, sorry, the function is 3x plus 1 times x minus 2 squared. So this 0 came from this term. It has multiplicity 1. But this 0 
came from this term, and it has multiplicity 2, which means it's going to uh, deflect off the axis. It just touches the axis and turns back around. So what's the largest number of turning points? And again, here's the function. I really wish the book copied this over, but whatever. This was 3x cubed plus other stuff when we distributed it. So it's a degree 3 polynomial. So it has at most two turning points. So now let's try to combine all of that information. Okay. So <clears throat> here's the graph, but let's see why that's the case. So first things first, I'd start with the x-axis. And I'd say, I know I have a root at negative 1 third. Okay, and this was of odd multiplicity. And I know I have a root at 2, 0 of even multiplicity. I know I also that this is the only set of roots. Here's the y-axis. It's in between x equals negative a third and x equals 2. And we found our intercept. It was at 0, 4. So since <clears throat> these are the only intercepts, in between these two intercepts, the graph is either always positive or always negative. Well, since I know it's positive here, it's always positive. So I would do something like this. Now, since it's an even multiplicity root, it's just going to deflect off of it. This is an odd multiplicity root, which means the graph goes through the axis there. And here's basically how I do it by hand. If you plot a couple extra points manually, you get some extra information. But really, you've, you've accomplished everything you could by saying, here are the roots. In between the roots, I'm always positive. To the left of the roots, I'm sorry, I'm either always positive or always negative. But because we found the set at a positive y value, it was always positive in between the roots. To the right of this root, it was either always positive or always negative. Because this was an even multiplicity root, I have to deflect and then just be positive. You could also have a test value like 310 that the book computes and say, well, to the right of this root, I'm either always positive or always negative. And since I'm positive here, I must be always positive. Uh, alternately, you could use end behavior. I know this was a degree 3 polynomial with a positive leading coefficient, which means to the left and the right, it has that type of end behavior. And since I've kind of done all of the roots I can, there's no more turning points. I had one turning point here and one turning point here. It was degree three, so those are all of them. It's got to just go up, and there's its end behavior. Similarly, off to the left, since it has to eventually be going down like this, I don't have any more turnings, so I have to just go down from this point. <clears throat> Oops. OK, so a couple of actual labeled points can help establish scale. That's really helpful when you have a graphing utility. When you're hand drawing, no one really assumes you're being that accurate anyway. OK, let's look at another example. Can you graph this? So again, what's the degree? What's the leading coefficient? Is it positive or negative? That helps determine end behavior. What are the roots and with what multiplicities? Then you can determine in between the roots where is the function positive or negative, and make sure you don't put in too many turning points. So try to do all the same steps for this one. OK, hopefully we paused and gave it a shot. So if we expand everything out, we'll see that we have a degree 4 polynomial with a leading coefficient of 1. That's really all we need here. Getting this constant term is kind of helpful because it does give us the intercept. Okay, but basically, we have a degree 4 polynomial, which means the end behavior is either both up or both down. But since it has a positive leading term here, it's both up. Okay, so f goes to infinity, positive, on both directions of x going to infinity. The intercept is negative 36. You can get that by plugging f of 0 in here. But if you plug f of 0 in here, it's easier because everything vanishes except for the negative 36. Okay, so the y-intercept is negative 36. The zero intercepts, uh, sorry, the x-intercepts are more easily found by the factoring property. So I'm going to go back to the previous slide. The function was x plus 1, x plus 3 squared, x minus 4. So <clears throat> either x plus 1 is 0, x plus 3 squared is 0, or x minus 4 is 0. These give us intercepts of negative 1, negative 3, and 4, respectively. So those are the zeros. 
x equals negative 1 and x equals 4 both have multiplicity 1, but look that x equals negative 3 is a root of multiplicity 2. So two of these represent roots where I actually cross the axis, but one of them is a deflection type root. OK, since I was degree 4, we have at most three turning points. That's helpful to bear in mind. <clears throat> So then we could put down a couple of extra values, f of, f of negative 4, negative 2, 1, and 3, just to help establish where it's especially big versus not. Okay, So we could uh, compute these values. This is kind of optional. Um, it is helpful, but it's just how do you know how many points to compute? How do you know which points are good to compute? I don't know. You just kind of put down a couple of values, and it just helps. But there's no uh, fixed procedure here. And if we plot those points and connect things up, so we knew this was a root of multiplicity 2. So it had to be a deflection point. This was a root of multiplicity 1, so the graph was definitely going to cross. And this was a root of multiplicity 1, so the graph was definitely going to cross. <clears throat> In between these two roots, the graph is either always positive or always negative. Since this intercept was negative, we knew the graph is always negative. So then. Between this root and this root, I know I have something kind of like this. Exactly what it does, that's where plotting in a couple of points is handy. So we knew this point here, this point here, this point here. So it could have been linked up, you know, some, something kind of like that. Uh, similarly, in between these two roots, it was either always positive or always negative. One single test point gives us always positive. To the left of this root and to the right of this root, it's either always positive or always negative. And then either using test points or knowing the end behavior, it has to go up eventually. And I can't have any more turning points, and I can't have any more roots, so I have to just start going up on both sides here. And that's how you put that picture together. OK, so we will uh, continue this section with another video that just does more examples and some uh, word problems involving modeling.